I learned a uh, new guardian adage this week. Holly, I think this is right. You can correct me on that if you want to. Uh, with all trees in our community suffering unto death, is that not the saddest thing to watch? I think the trees were more excited yesterday than we were. Uh, when is a good time to plant a tree? I get people ask me that. Can I plant a tree? Can I plant a tree now or then? And I've learned this last week from a gardener or somewhere that you plant trees in months that have R's in them. And the reason for that, and it sounds so silly, like April. September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, and then you'll, you'll plant a tree. And the reason for that is real simple. During the summer months, a tree wants to produce blooms, it wants to grow big fruits. But if you plant it in April or May, what happens is the tree wants to produce blooms before it grows roots. If you plant it in a colder month, mainly September, October, what happens is the tree naturally goes dormant and it starts to focus all of its attention on those root structures. You're not an edge, she's a word of the so that helps. But, you're, you're, she's, but it, it starts to grow those roots and those roots get real strong and it, it doesn't need as much water because the sun is not as brutal. And then it begins to grow those roots, those roots grow deep, and then when the summer hits, it's ready to produce blooms. An easy way to think of this is roots before blooms. And so you plant your trees in the month with an R in it. This is the HGTV sermon. <laughs> really. I find that the natural world, however, mirrors the spiritual world sometimes. The natural world that we see around us is a very good way of looking at how we do spiritual life. We love the fruit of labor, the benefits of a paycheck, and the results of hard work and discipline. We just don't want labor, hard work, or discipline. Can I get an amen? Not true. We want fruit before roots. We want blooms before roots. That's just a natural of who we are. I would love to have a six pack. I just like chips only cookies. <laughs> That's the problem. We love the blooms. We just don't want to spend the countless hours it takes to develop the roots that produce those blooms. So we buy silk plants. So that looks like we have roots. For us to become a God has begun inside of us. We're going to have to do some work. There are no shortcuts. There's no easy fix. There's not a six-week course. There is a lifelong course of building spiritual roots, developing things that go deep. The difference between us and the plants is that we don't need the month with an R in it. You can start at any time to develop roots that go deep so that you might be able to produce fruit. For Isaac, it's time for him to grow some roots. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 26. He has been in the shadow of his father, and now it's time for him to step up and lead his family. He has been watching his dad. He has been receiving the transfers that his dad has been giving him. It's all been wonderful and good, but now it's time for him to develop roots. And it's not going to be easy, but he is going to produce some fruit. And so you begin to see this story really in a short chapter Genesis chapter 26. It's kind of sad in some ways. Abraham received nearly 12 chapters of his life story. Jacob is going to get about 25, depending on how you want to look at it, with the Joseph story. Isaac gets one, maybe one half or two. He's almost a footnote in comparison. But within his story, I think you're going to see a lot of commonality in his father's life. You're just not going to get all of the detail that you got in his dad. Those a couple things that are similar in his dad's life and as well as his. First of all, they both faced a famine. They both faced Egypt. They both were deceptive. They both had enemies. They both had a peer named Abimelech. They both were established and had a foothold in the land. And they both in the end received peace. They received all these things in growing roots for the kingdom of God. And I want you to notice a couple things. We experience circumstances as well that cause us to grow some roots. In Jacob's day, in Abraham's day, was a famine. But you and I go through some circumstances that would cause us to grow some roots. A fear of going without your basic needs. A fear of perhaps losing a job, not having enough money. Yesterday morning for us at our house, on our block, we were part of the 2,100 people that didn't have electricity. Brooke said, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? We don't have electricity. She said, I got an iPad. Take the iPad out. You can exist without electricity, can we not? No. <laughs> Fear of going without our basic needs. This is what struck Isaac and the famine. Egypt is that place that you escape to when you think your basic needs are not going to be met. 
You run to that place when you're afraid and don't think God is going to take care of you. We don't have the Egypt that we run to, but we do have that fear of not having our basic needs met. And we do have that place that we might run to to find security, to find help, or to perhaps get something that's outside of what God would have for us. We run to that place. In Isaac's day, it was Egypt. Sometimes when we don't think we can get it from that place, we deceive. Isaac did that. Abraham did that. When you don't get what you think God will meet your needs, you use any way possible to get it there. We'll see how Isaac did that. The next one is we have enemies, fears, those who <coughs> seek ruin in your life. We have those too inside of our lives today. We'll see where Isaac had that. Then we have Abimelech, a different kind of peer, and that's the entity that's just always there to, for your good or bad, a good friend. You need to have those kinds of people in your life that are there with you in good or bad. Abimelech was a leader. It's the same name that is used in Abraham's story, but this is some 70 to 90 years later, so it's probably a title as opposed to an actual name. And then we have an establishment. When God gives you a foothold, you remember as a young adult when you were first getting setting out in your life as maybe a young married or as a young single and you're just trying to get enough furniture to fill the room? You remember that? Maybe you're still in that. Maybe you're still living in that. Remember that moment when you're just trying to get your rhythm in life, trying to get a savings account, perhaps a solid paying job, and then finally you get to that age and stage in your life where you have a house. Maybe it's mostly paid for. You have furniture that you're not afraid to keep for a long period of time. You're able to kind of say, i got a foothold in life. We'll see how Isaac gets that in this place. And then finally, you saw us at the end of Abraham's life, and you get it in the end of Isaac's life as well, where you establish rest. What comes directly from God when you listen and you obey. You see these growing your roots. You see them inside of Jacob's or Isaac's life here in chapter 26. Let me show you where these come out. Notice what it says in verse 1. Now there was a famine in the land that, besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Bimelech, the king of the Philistines. When there's a famine, it's because they don't have enough water. There's a crisis. You're familiar with the lack of water. He has no water, they have no food. It's not like they can just pump it in from some other location. No water, there's a crisis. And as I got to thinking about crises in our lives today, we have basically three different kinds of crises. We have a self-inflicted crisis. The worst kind of wound you can ever have is the self-inflicted wound, because who are you going to blame? You. A self-inflicted wound, and you get the other's inflicted crisis. That's when somebody else in your life does something that messes up your life. Perhaps had nothing to do with it. It just happened because somebody in your life messed up. A spouse that faltered. It could be a job boss that got mad. It could be a job that went away. It could be a parent that is acting like a child. It could be a child that refuses to obey. Whatever it is, it's an others inflicted crisis, and we have faced those before. And then you get a life inflicted crisis. This is just when life catches up to you. You've had that happen too, haven't you? It just catches up. You get sick, you get old, health issues, economic downturns, a natural disaster. It's just a part of life. You have these kinds of crises inside of your life. The matter is, is how are you going to handle them? Here's a tip. Eliminate self-inflicted crises. Stop hurting yourself. Stop doing things that will bring damage. It's really the only one you can control. The next one is when it comes to those others inflicted crises, try to minimize those people in your life that can do you great harm. I don't have a lot of friends in my life that abuse drugs, so I don't worry about drug dealers knocking on my door. You know where I'm going? You understand? If you eliminate those who cause or have bad habits and do things that are great harm, then you will limit those others inflicted types of crises. You can choose your friends, but life inflicted crises just happen. You can do your best to prepare for them, take care of your body. Have a savings account. Keep your car maintained, your house in order. You can't eliminate life-inflicted crises, but you can prepare for them. So it's just a little bit of Dr. Phil tips there when it comes to crises in your life. But here you get crises in his life. On each of these, what is he going to do? How is he going to respond to this? But notice that a crisis comes with, to a man who is following God. Please ignore prosperity gospel preachers who will tell you if you just follow God, nothing will go wrong. They're lying to you. Okay, turn the channel. They should not be on TVN. They should be on Comedy Central because that's funny to me. Okay? 
Okay? Because crises happen. And what crises do in your life is they draw you close to God. Notice what happens in verse 2. The Lord appeared to him in the midst of a crisis. says, don't go to Egypt. That place that you run to when you don't believe me. Don't go to Egypt. Stay right here where I have put you in the land night and do what I tell you. Sojourn in this land. And I will be with you and I will bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all of these lands. How many of them? All of them. And I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. And I will multiply your descendants as the stars in heaven. And I will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, and my statutes, and my law. Catch a phrase that kept popping up through that section. Did you know the pronoun? Who's the primary subject in this section? Who is it? I, right? God. Who's the I? God. Who's going to take care of Isaac? God. All Isaac has to do is obey. And so when you face a crisis, you remember God's promises, and that's exactly what Isaac is being told here. You have a crisis, Isaac. It's a matter of life and death. What is Isaac supposed to do? Remember the promises of God. God will take care of him. And you have the same kind of promises, not the exact same, but you have a God who says, I will take care of your needs. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. He's not talking about possessions. He's not talking about a bigger house and a nicer car. He's talking about his presence with you. Seek him first. All these other stressors, God will take care of them and give you the strength to endure and to bear up underneath of that. But seek him first. And so the question here becomes, with Isaac, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Notice what it says in verse 6. So Isaac lived in Gerar. He did not go to Egypt. Isaac obeyed. He did exactly what God asked him to do. God promised to be present inside the middle of this crisis. God promised to be a blessing. Not in the sense that you would hear today on some of those televangelists that tell you if you just follow God, he'll make everything go easy for you. But he, God would bless him with his presence. And God would take care of him. Why? Because Isaac was the descendant of Abraham who obeyed. Now, is Isaac going to obey? And that's really a question that you and I face even today. Will you obey? Will you do what God has asked you to do? Ultimately, Isaac trusts God with the family. He stays right there, and God takes care of him. But there's a problem. Can we do much about the weather? So it's rather easy to trust God with the weather, is it not? Because there's nothing that I can do about it. And so I'll just trust God with the weather. When things are outside of my control, it's almost easier to trust God because, you know, God, I can't control that. So I'll let you do that. You know where I have a hard time? It's when I have a little bit of influence in the things that I'm going through, and then I think I can fix it. Am I the only one? I think I can do it. I have a harder time trusting God with that one because me do it. I think I can do it. God, you take care of things I can't control, like the cosmos, the natural order, all these big things out here. I'll take care of all these other things because you know you're busy. You have a lot of things that people take care of. So all of these little things. And that's where Isaac bumps into. Can't take care of the natural world. God will take care of the famine. God will provide. But then there's something that comes up, and it's in this next section here. He lives with inside the city of Gerar. When the men of the place asked about his wife, sound a little familiar? Isaac said, she is my sister. Rebecca went out there. <coughs> For he was afraid to say, my wife, thinking men of the place might kill me on account of Rebecca, for she is so beautiful. He's got to get a chuckle out of that. I think that's how Isaac tried to recover from his error. You're, I'm your sister? He said, oh, but Rebecca, you're so beautiful. They would kill me. You're so good looking. They would kill me. You're just so pretty. He's like, no, you're just so pretty. And that maybe that will you forget the fact that he denied any relationship with her outside of a mere sibling. So he says, he lies. He lies. He deceives. He had the famine. We had a place in Egypt to go to. He doesn't. He stays in Gerar. Is this time now where he can actually trust God for his descendants? And he lies about his wife. That's my sister. That's not my wife. He's afraid of his own life. And he's afraid of what these men might do to him. So he deceives what he could actually do himself. He fails. He should have said, that is my wife. God would have protected him. We'll see in the life of his son as well. As Jacob will try to do everything that he thinks God can't handle. 
Jacob will try to do it here. I see these things are inside of his control. He thinks that maybe his manipulation or his control of an environment that perhaps he can take care of those problems. But he can't. He decides to deceive. He compromises his integrity. He compromises God's promise. And then he compromises people. And I mean, kind of watch your life and how you're, am I trusting God or am I making things happen or is God doing this? Ask yourself those questions. Am I compromising my integrity in doing this? Am I compromising God's promises? But you really trust God. The end will be his, of his doing. Am I compromising people in these decisions that I'm making? When you look at Isaac's decision, he failed in all of these. He compromised his integrity. He lied. He stole. He cheated. He lied. He compromised the promise. He didn't think God was big enough to take care of his needs, multiply his decisions. He compromised the people. He sacrificed Rebekah because he was afraid. He should have stood by the promise of God. And so we see him in verse 2, or in verse 6, he's obeying wonderfully. But in verses 7 through 11, he fails and he is caught in his lie. Abimelech sees him with Rebekah. He says, that's not your sister. That's your wife. Isaac comes clean and says, yes, but I was afraid that you might kill me. Abimelech says wisely, what is this you have done in verse 10? One of our people might have taken your wife and laid with her, and you would have brought guilt upon all of us. So Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife will surely be put to death. But notice something. God saves Isaac from himself. God protects Isaac. God also protects Abimelech. God also protects the citizens of Gerar. God's sovereignty covers everything he protects. Even when he makes such a silly decision, God is in advance his sovereign control is over everything. God has established a promise with Isaac in the midst of a crisis, a famine. God protects Isaac in the middle of a self-inflicted crisis. He lied. He didn't have to. But God took care of him. Self-inflicted crisis. Now there's another crisis, and this crisis comes up from others. Will God protect him from the crisis that is coming in verses 12 through 24? Today in the Middle East, there is a problem. The Islamic world and the Arab world does not want Israel at all in the Middle East. How do you negotiate with the group of people that says, we want you dead? And you say, half dead? And you say, well, you can have half my life. But you say, well, half would be it if you can. That's nothing new. This story here, we'll have to read it, 12 through 24, is the same story. What happens there is Isaac plants and he reaps the same year a hundredfold. Who does that? His first year planting, his harvest is huge and it gets bigger. God is blessing him. And the people around him say, we're jealous of you. We're jealous of what God is doing in you. We want your stuff. And so they begin to fill the well, wells water with stones and rocks and cap off the wells. Isaac begins to get a foothold in a place and the people come through and they push him out. And they keep pushing him out. And finally he finds a place at the very end in verse 22. Two. He moved from there and dug a well, and there, and they did quarrel with. They did not quarrel with him there. So he named it Rechaboth, for he said, "At last, the Lord has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in the land." God gives him a presence, a foothold inside of this land. We have a crisis and a promise. We have deception and fear. We have rejection and then ultimately establishment. God gives him a place. He trusts God. And God blesses him. But this whole crisis in the Middle East, this whole thing that we see all the time of wanting to get rid of Israel, it's nothing new. It's a sibling rivalry. The Egyptians and the Philistines are descendants from Ham. Isaac is a descendant of Shem, as well as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there will always be conflict with these groups. Always. And here you see it popping up in Genesis 26. You'll see it tomorrow in the news. You'll see it the next day in the next day. They've always been pushing Israel to the outside. And they will until Jesus comes. Comes and takes his home with him. He establishes peace in the Middle East. Until then, it's just a campaign. It's just people trying to say what they can do. He really can't because only God will be able to do that when he establishes his kingdom. But we see it all the way back in the book of Genesis where he struggles with rejection and then ultimately God establishes him in his place. Notice what happens next. You get peace with his neighbors in 26 through 33. We see this also in the story of Abraham. Well, finally, those around him, Abimelech comes down, Abimelech and Phicol, they come, and these are titles. 
not names per se, these are different men that came to Abraham, and they established a covenant with Isaac, and he has finally had peace. They see that the Lord has blessed him, and look at verse 29. He says that, uh, in close to 28, they said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So he said, let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm. Just as we have not touched you and have done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace. It's kind of a half truth. It's not really all true. It's partially true. But notice this last phrase. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Part of the promise that God gave to Abraham is that he would be a blessing to the nations. And they're acknowledging the fact that he is. Those around him, around Isaac, are recognizing that God has put his hand upon Isaac. Isn't that awesome? I think it's true for us today, too, that if you follow the Lord, if you listen and obey, you do that as God calls you to do. You're the man or the woman in that office, on that job site, in that cab, wherever you might be. If you follow the Lord, people will begin to recognize something different about you. God will begin to bless. People will begin to identify you as somebody who walks with the Lord. And so, in verse 30, he has a barbecue. He gives them a feast. They ate and they drank. And they rose early in the morning. They exchanged oaths. Then Isaac sent them away in verse 31. And they departed from him in peace. And he calls that place Beersheba. That's where they established peace. That's the oath. Beersheba is the oath by the wells. And so here he says, this is where we have peace. God is establishing him. Peace with his neighbors, those around him. And then it ends, it's kind of a unique way here, and that is with Esau's wife. It's kind of like one of those passages you go, how is this, where is this fitting in? And sometimes in the Bible they broke it down in chapter and verse. This almost seems like it should fit better in chapter 27. But, but look how it says, when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Berite the Hittite, the Basimah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. He married two different girls. And they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. What a footnote for Esau's life. The first part we see in Esau, he sells his birthright. This next part, he's going to be deceived by his brother. He did it wrong. He should not have taken, should not have done what he did. But Esau here sells his birthright. Then he marries two girls that just make his parents' life miserable. Just a footnote to this. Students, young adults, when you're thinking about getting married, if your parents don't think it's a good fit, guess what? Probably not. Probably not. You probably should trust your mom and your dad. And here, Isaac and Rebecca have just heartburn over Esau's rash choices. His way of making decisions has brought grief upon both of them. In this short chapter, you get an overview of his life. You get a man who has a place, a crisis, in a family. He turns to God. He goes to doesn't go to Egypt, he establishes himself in obedience, but then he faces deception and fear where he thinks he can control things, and he can't. It causes great pain to Rebecca and to those around him, but God's sovereignty covers him. He establishes or peace is given to him as God puts him in the land and gives him a hundredfold return on his labor. God gives him peace with his neighbors as he walks, listens, and he obeys. And God does the same thing for us. We'll establish all kinds of We'll experience all kinds of crises in our life. Some of them self-inflicted, others inflicted, or just life inflicted. When we walk and follow God, He establishes peace for us. Let's talk about roots. Some things I think are developing inside of Isaac's life. Roots are non-transferable. Isaac has to build his own roots. He doesn't have his daddy's roots. He's got to go through it himself. And that's true for our lives. Your faith is going to grow independently of your parents. You have to build your own faith, establishing your own roots. Roots are not growing instantly. It takes time. It's not just plug and play, download the app, I have roots. That's not true. You have to spend the time and the effort and the energy. Roots are the channels of life. You try to go through life without roots, you're going to have a fruitless tree that will produce no blooms. You have to allow time and then allow those roots to get strong. And finally, roots need to be stretched. They need to be developed. They need to grow. They need to be put through the ringer. Several months ago, Melanie and I had the opportunity to go to Dallas and we let our, my in-laws take care of our children, whether they like it or not. <laughs> we left the kids with Frank and Dean. We went to Grapevine. 
We stayed at the Gaylord Tanks in that big resort-like hotel. Beautiful. Got to stay there for two nights. And we one day went down into the grapevine uh, to, uh, to tour the shops. They have all kinds of little shops down there on Main Street. And we just enjoyed walking through there. We walked into one shop that had a whole wine. It was a wine shop. It was just beautiful. All the wine all down that side. And with a city called Grapevine, one would naturally believe that they actually have vineyards there. And they have all these places that are growing grapes to make wine. And so I asked the guys, now which ones of these wines was, was made here? And he said, oh, none of them. There is not a vineyard one inside of grapevine. And I said, well, don't you think that's a little deceptive? Your city's a fraud. And you don't have grapevines? And what's that all about? And he said, well, actually what happened then, Many, many years ago, when this place was established, there was a, a grapevine that grew here, but it was basically a weed. It did grow grapes, but it was so wild and it was so bad that it was just terrible. They called it grapevine after that terrible weed. And then several years ago, when the North Dallas area and this area was booming, they decided to capitalize on the word grapevine, and we'll turn this into kind of a bed and breakfast, grapevine, wine tasting place, and everybody will think that we actually grow wine here, when we actually import it from everywhere else, except here. I said, well, why don't you guys just avoid being called a bunch of liars and find a great wine? And then you guys can make your own wine here. And he said, well, the soil here is too good. The soil here is too rich. It's, it's, it's too wet. What makes good wine is you have to have good sun. And then you have to have a soil that has a silty, acidic level to it that is kind of rocky. It has to be difficult soil. It can't be this nice black soil clay that we have. It has to be really a difficult, hard soil for it to produce good wine. That's why Italy, the coast of California, produces such great wines, because their soil is not this plush, nice soil. It's rocky. It's hard, because those roots have to work really, really hard to produce a good grape. See where we're going with this? In order to produce good grapes for good wine, the roots have to work really, really hard. They have to be stretched and strained. They have to work for those nutrients. They have to be scrappy and difficult and strive for. They have to get a good bit of sun in order for the grapes to really become good grapes. I look at Jacob's life. I look at our lives. I look at Isaac's life. Those who produce great fruit have experienced some time in rocky soil. They had experienced time when things were difficult and rough, and their roots had to really depend upon God. I remember going through a, a rocky season in my life, and I remember the presence of God just seemed to be so close. It was as if He had a bullhorn in my soul. I can almost hear Him. It was so powerful. And if you've gone through that kind of a valley, the shadow of death, you know what it sounds like. For roots to really grow, they need to be stretched. They need to be developed. So don't run from that stretching. Don't run to the side and try to avoid it. Allow it to happen. Allow your roots to go deep. They're non-transferable. They don't grow overnight. It takes work. And you've got to let it go through some difficulty. For those of our senior adults who've experienced that difficulty, you produce a different kind of fruit that everybody gets to enjoy. Roots before blooms. We all want the fruit, but we just don't want to work at it. You see in Isaac's life, God has given him these promises, but he's going to have to learn to face a crisis. He's going to have to learn to trust God, even when he thinks he can do it. He's going to have to learn to make peace and allow God to establish it. He's going to learn to trust God. God will grow him if he will just let God do the work. God will bless him.